risk is everywhere. It's something we face in our everyday life. When you get in your car to go to work in the morning, when crossing the street, all activities involve some sort of risk. In relation to food, business and economy, climate change, medicine and health, and engineering and technology, and many, many other areas. So, risk is a highly relevant concept. It is used in so many different contexts. But what does risk mean? How should we interpret and understand this concept? Researchers and scientists have discussed the meaning of the risk term for years. But there is not one straightforward interpretation and definition of the risk term. Many organizations and societies have attempted to agree on one and only one definition of risk, but most have failed. The problem is that they have tried to agree on one correct way of measuring risk, but that would be difficult as different situations call for different ways of measuring risk. For example, a probability number can be an informative risk measurement in some cases, but not in others. If the task is to explain what climate change risk is, for example, you cannot simply refer to probabilities. So, it is very important that we make a clear distinction between the concept of risk and how you are measuring describing, characterizing the risk. The key is that to look into the concept in qualitative terms, the concept of risk and how you are measuring or describing or characterizing risk on the other hand. Intuitively and conceptually, risk is about something undesirable potentially happening. Environmental damage, economic loss, an accident causing injuries or fatalities. This idea leads us to thinking about risk having two main features. Consequences, loss, damage and uncertainty. There's the potential, we do not know what will happen, we may experience undesirable negative consequences but also positive desirable consequences. We refer to the consequences as C and the uncertainty as U. Let's look into one example to illustrate this idea. Tony is a student at the University of Stavanger. To get to the university, Tony rides his bike one morning, when he is in a rush to attend an important lecture at university, he collides with a car. The bike is completely wrecked, but luckily he noticed an electric scooter available for rent close by, so he grabs it and shoots away to the university, making it there just in time for class. When he is riding his bike to the university, he is facing risk. There is a potential he crashes the bike. This is the event A. This event could have different consequences C. He could get minor injuries. He could get severely injured. His bike could be more or less wrecked and he could be late for his class. Before Tony gets on his bike in the morning, we do not know whether he will fall or not. He will crash or not and what the consequences will be. There are uncertainties. He faces risks. So risk is CU or ACU. We have introduced the concept of risk. 
Next, we will discuss how to express or describe the risk to be able to say something about how large or big the risk is. Then we need to specify events and consequences and assess the uncertainties. Let us return to the Tony bike example. How large is the risk that he is facing? First, we need to clarify what events that could occur. Say that we restrict attention to his bike crashing. That's the type of event, the A event. The consequences can be related to his health, but also we could think about consequences related with not attending the class. But let us focus on the consequences C, that he is seriously injured, including being killed, as a result of the accident. Probability is a common tool to express the uncertainties. To express the risk, we then need to specify two probabilities. The probability that he crashes, probability of A, and the probability of being seriously injured as a result of the crash, the probability of C, given that A occurs. The product of these two probabilities would then be the probability of a crash leading to a serious injury. Suppose you arrive at the probability of this event, a crash leading to a serious injury, as less than or equal to 1%. Would that capture all what you need to know about the uncertainties you? No, you would ask about what is the basis for this number? What knowledge, data, information, justified beliefs, assumptions is this probability based on? Clearly, if this basis is strong, the number is more informative than if it's weak or poor. Consequently, we also need to include this knowledge and judgments of how strong this knowledge is. We refer to it as the strength of knowledge, SOK. And, um, it's included in the risk characterization. So from this, we are led to a general risk description or characterization of the form events and consequences. We call them A marked and C marked to distinguish them from the actual events occurring A and C. So A mark is the specified events. Here the bike crash or not. C the specified consequences. Here the serious injury or not. P is the probability, knowledge base, as it's based on the knowledge K, SOK, the knowledge strength, the strength of the knowledge, and K, the knowledge that is the basis for this assessment. A concept that often appears when discussing risk is vulnerability. So how can we understand this term in a risk context? To explain this, we can start with the ACU representation of risk. This expression, ACU, can be divided into two parts, the risk of an event occurring and the consequences given that this event occurs with associated uncertainties. The first part can be referred to as the event risk and the latter component as vulnerability. Vulnerability is essentially the potential for undesirable consequences given an event. In the Tony bike example, vulnerability thus refers to the potential for injuries given a crash. That is the combination of consequences and uncertainties given a crash. As for risk, we can distinguish between the concept of vulnerability and how to measure or describe vulnerability. For the measurement and description part, we can think like risk, except that we presume that the event A has occurred. In the Tony bike example, we may describe the vulnerability as the probability of Tony being injured or serious injured given a crash with associated judgments of the strength of the knowledge supporting the probability statement. Now, which factors influence vulnerability of a system? 
One of them is the ability of the system to return to a normal state after an event has occurred, also known as resilience. In other words, the resilience aspects provides input to vulnerability judgments. But while the resilience concept only captures the system's ability to recover after an event, the vulnerability concept also covers the actual consequences of the event. To illustrate the difference, consider Tony biking example again. In this example, Tony was able to make it to the university in time for class, despite the unfortunate event. He was resilient in that respect. But if we want to reflect on Tony's vulnerability in this situation, we need to take a broader view and consider the consequences of the event. His resilience, his ability to bounce back from the event clearly has an impact on the consequences. So it's an important aspect of his vulnerability, but vulnerability also extends beyond resilience. The bike is broken, for example, so there are clearly some financial consequences there. And Tony got some serious bruises and marks from the fall that might require medical attention. These are factors that did not necessarily influence Tony's resilience, but when we are discussing his vulnerability in relation to this event, we need to take these aspects into account. In relation to discussions about risk, we often refer to the terms safety and security. What do these concepts mean? And what is the link between safety and security on the one hand and risk on the other? When it comes to safety, we can interpret this concept as the antonym of risk. A high safety level means low risk and vice versa. This also goes to security. If we restrict the concept of risk to relate to intentional acts by intelligent actors. If we, for example, say it's safe to walk on the ice, it means that the risk is just sufficiently low. This could be expressed as saying that the probability of going through the ice is very small and the knowledge supporting this probability is strong. What is sufficiently small and strong depends on the context, experience, what is established practice, perceptual issues, values and so on. And it is a risk handling and management issue. We need to conclude on whether we find that judge risk can be ignored or found acceptable, which are concepts that belong to the risk management sphere. Risk is often referred to as probability times consequences. What is defined as the expected value in probability and statistics? This way of understanding risk goes back some more than 300 years when the French mathematician Abraham de Marvre defined risk in this way. It is attractive as it is one metric, a single number, making it easier to work with in a decision-making context. It can be useful in some context where we consider the average of many similar situations, like in games, insurance context, and in medicine and health. However, risk science warns against the use of this way of expressing risk, this metric. There are two main problems. The first is that the expected value does not reflect the potential for extreme consequences. Here are two probability distributions linked with two activities. They have the same center of gravity, the same expected value, but these are completely different. There's a potential for extreme outcomes in this case. In this case, the outcome will be close to expected value. Describing risk using the expected value would then lead to the conclusion that the risk for these two activities is the same. But the potential for experiencing extreme outcomes is many times higher for the second activity. When describing the risk, we need to describe the potential for extreme events and outcomes. It is essential for how to handle the risk. The second problem 
with a use of expected value to express risk is that it does not reflect the knowledge supporting these specified probabilities forming the expected value as we have discussed earlier. In practice, standard risk matrices are often used to present the risk. The matrix typically shows the risk expressed for different events, hazard threats, using the probability of the event, PA, and the conditional expected value, expected value EC given A, or a typically C value, for different categories of consequences. Risk science warns against the use of this type of risk matrices. There are two main problems. First, the consequences of the events are in many cases not properly represented by one point in the matrix, but by several with different probabilities. If we restrict attention to one point, this value would typically be interpreted as expected value or conditional expected value given the initiating event, which is the center of gravity of the probability distribution for the appropriate consequences. In most cases, this value is not very informative in showing the range of possible consequences. Take the event pandemic. It is possible to foresee many scenarios with severe negative impact, ranging from a rather limited number of affected persons to situations where millions are suffering. Grouping all such scenarios into one and highlighting only the expected value can obviously lose essential information needed to characterize the risk to usefully inform decisions. And the second problem with risk matrix is that two events can have the same location in the risk matrix, but the knowledge supporting these judgments could be very, very different. To meet these challenges, adjusted risk matrices have been developed. One approach is to use an extended risk matrix as you see in this figure, which presents risk using consequence categories given the events and probabilities of the events and strength of knowledge judgments. In the figure, four events are shown. As an example, consider the event in the right lower corner. This event has a catastrophic consequence, a low probability, less than 1%, less or equal than 1%, and weak strength of knowledge. Another approach is to fix the consequences, for example, by looking at events with at least X fatalities, and then focus on the probability of this type of event, as you see in this figure. With the consequences specified, the risk characterizations would cover two dimensions for the events considered. The probability P of the event and the strength of knowledge SOK, supporting the probability judgments. The scores are judgments made by the assessors. In the figure, the biggest risk are those in the right upper corner as these have high scores on probability and weak knowledge strengths. Risk defined by expected values and probabilities could hide important aspects of risk. The strength of knowledge needs to be included because it provides essential information and guidance, not only on the amount of weight we should give the assigned numbers, but also on where the potential for experiencing surprising events is largest. This dimension of risk, the surprises that could occur relative to what we currently know or believe, sometimes referred to as black swans, is also an important aspect of risk that should be taken into account. We define a black swan as a surprising extreme event relative to one's knowledge. Extreme means that events have large severe consequences. It's common to refer to three main types of black swan events. A. Events that were completely unknown to scientific environment, unknown unknowns. B. Events not on the list of known events from the perspective of those who carried out a risk analysis or another stakeholder, but known to others, unknown knowns. Unknown events to some, known to others. And C events on the list of known events in the risk analysis but not believed to occur because of very low judge probability. The term black swan is used to express any of these type of events, tacitly assuming that it carries an extreme impact. The first category of black swan type of events, A, is the extreme, this 
Typhoid event is unknown to everybody, the scientific community and others. A good example is the AIDS ep epidemic. The second type of black swan B is events that are not captured by the relevant risk assessments, either because we do not know them or we have not made a sufficiently thorough consideration. If the event then occurs, it was not foreseen. If a more thorough risk analysis had been conducted, it, the event could have been identified. The September 11 attack is a good example of this type of black swan. The third category of black swans comprises events that occur despite the fact that the probability of occurrence is judged to be very small. The events are known but considered so unlikely, with sufficiently knowledge support, that they are ignored. They are not believed to occur and cautionary measures are not implemented. An example is the event that an unwatered volcano eruption occurs in the Atlantic Sea, leading to a tsunami affecting, for example, Norway. The events are on the list of hazard and risk sources, but then removed as the probability is judged so low. The recurrence will come as a surprise. Okay, so this video has covered some key topics of chapter two and three of this uh, eminent book. And uh, not all topics are covered, but the essential topics. You need to understand what risk means and related concepts like safety, security, resilience and vulnerability. And you need to understand the difference between the risk concept and other concepts and how you describe them. So I recommend that you really look into the book and read it carefully because there are a lot of more detail, a lot more details in the book discussing these topics.